The feeling of releasing anything that you've created is unparalleled. I was just amazed by what you could achieve with no real background of knowing how to make games. I don't want to torment myself by spending, you know, weeks and weeks making a bunch of art and then build a game and it doesn't work on everybody's computer. I would lie if I were to say that it's competent software, it simply is not. Making video games is hard. Game engines often have steep learning curves. Many require you to learn a programming language and a host of other technical arts. But what if you find programming difficult? What if you want the basics taken care of so you can focus on making your game unique? What if you want to create your own game quickly and easily? For over 20 years, a small studio based in the north of England aptly named The Game Creators, have been producing software to do just that. This is the story of how The Game Creators set out to change the world of game development, bringing it to the masses, and both the positive and negative effects that had. It's about the love-hate relationship The Game Creators have with their most valuable resource, their community, and with their latest product, Game Guru Max, approaching release, it's a look at the future and whether it's really as bright as they say it is. Firstly, I think it's important I share my own backstory with the game creators. I've wanted to make video games since I was a kid. My sketch pads are filled with level layouts, weapon designs, and menu screen mock-ups. My dad bought me the game creator's first product, Dark Basic, in 2003, but I quickly discovered I don't have the patience, or let's be honest, the smarts, to write code. Their 2005 product FPS Creator was what really got me hooked, and I began creating my own levels and 3D models soon after. After several years of focusing mainly on filmmaking, I came back to hobbyist game development in 2017 with Game Guru, the much maligned easy game maker, and have spent thousands of hours creating my own levels and making assets and tools to use in it. Now, the game creator's latest product, Game Guru Max, is trying to shake off the tarnished reputation of its predecessors with overhauled graphics, smarter AI, and upgrades to the terrain system and character creator, amongst a host of other improvements. The story of the game creators is best told in the words of its founder and CEO, Lee Bamber. I was nine years old, and I only had one Christmas present, and I unwrapped the box and it was a Commodore VIC-20 and it came with a huge silver ring bone manual and I went from cover to cover following all the instructions by the end of it I knew how to program a computer by the age of 12 I was making games and selling them I couldn't get enough of it making stuff and then sharing it and selling it I always liked the selling it part that was sort of something that motivated me personally a lot of people will be disenfranchised having wanting to make a game, use the big popular tools and realise they haven't made a game for one reason or another. I want Game Guru Max to be the catch net for those users. Don't give up your dreams of making a game. Before you give up completely, check out Game Guru Max. And I see that as being a real need. To understand what led us to this point, you have to go back to the beginning. No, before that. No, a lot further back than that. No, even further. 
Macclesfield, 1994. Lee joins Europress, the fifth largest game studio in the UK at the time, working for Rick Vanner on the demo games shipped with a game maker called Click and Play. So this was my first ever software development job and Rick Vanner at the time was project manager, producer. They were already working on a, on a product, Click and Play with a K. First, click on the menu item, Create a Game. This takes you to the storyboard editor. Double click and choose level editor. Across the top of the screen you'll now see... It was pretty much finished. It was buggy. My job was to create games. And I had to create games with a piece of software that had loads of bugs in it. So very early on in my career I learned how to save versions of my game constantly. But yeah, it was click and play. Then it was click and create. Um, other things, other products for, for Europress. Some of Lee's colleagues on these early game makers would go on to form Click Team, makers of 2D game engine Fusion. Today, the sky is no longer the limit. We had a great opportunity. Uh, Lego themselves contacted us. They wanted someone to, uh, to write software for, for a project they were working on. I thought it was a great idea, so I was bundled off to Denmark to work on this uh, project, which ultimately became something called Lego Mindstorms, which is a product which allows you to, strangely enough, build things, like robotic things, and then it would autonomously run around and do all these colour scanning or climb walls or whatever. And my job was the programming language part of building that out so you could click blocks together and it would get the robot to do things. Once you've built your robot, you can program it using RCX Code, a simple, powerful programming language. When I came back, about two years later, my desk had gone. And so I had this crazy idea, I'm going to write my own software. I thought, well, I'll sell it, I'll publish it myself then. That's the kind of person I was back then. So I made a website. I learned how to make a website, then made the website, then put the software on the website and started selling it. And I was selling like one or two a week. And I had to make the CDs and the boxes and I had to learn all that as well. I didn't have any costs, no responsibilities, but I had a, I had a piece of software. Um, it was called Dirt Basic. Lee's first product, Dark Basic, is a simple yet powerful programming language and IDE editor. It proves an accessible option for novice programmers, giving rise to a range of games across different genres. Uh, that's very, very first print of Dark Basic, back in the day when we had CD-ROMs. In fact, that's even dated 13th of the 12th, 1999, Beta 7. <laughs> that takes me back. That probably still works too. If you took it out and put it in the computer, it'll probably run. Certificate of Incorporation for the game creators used to be called Data Basic Software Limited. 1999, that's when all of this started. To learn more about Dark Basic's early days, I contacted Sean Bauer, who developed a string of space combat games using Dark Basic, starting with Star Wraith in 2000. Since the mid-80s, I'd worked mostly in DOS, where graphics, control support, and audio were all very limited and difficult to manage. Dark Basic helped make that process easier for me. It was almost difficult for me to believe what I was able to accomplish in such a short period of time and how good it looked compared to the projects I'd worked on earlier. My time was primarily spent designing HUD elements, spaceships, weapon systems, special effects sounds, and flight control systems, rather than fiddling with mountains of code. I recall sharing some exchanges with other developers at the time. It seemed like a fairly small group of interested programmers who helped each other out with guidance and feedback.
Star Wraith 2 was sold commercially on CD. I remember seeing the game on a shelf at a national computer store for the first time. Even though it was in the budget section among other case-only titles, it was still a pretty surreal experience. The few sales it generated were encouraging, and I knew I wanted to keep at it and continue to improve. What happened was a publisher approached us, came to us and says, we like your software, we want to publish it. The name of that company, I don't think the company exists anymore, it was called Fast Track. And publishers, they have a major role. You might think you can go out and sell software, but publishers, that's all they do, and they're very good at it. So I thought, yeah, great. Signed a contract, agreed terms. They did, they put it in a new box, redesigned it, and did very well. With publishers and agents taking notice, Lee's former manager at Europress, Rick Vanner, joins Dark Basic Software as an owner and development director in 2000. 2001 sees the release of Dark Matter, the first of three asset packs designed to supplement Dark Basic and give creators pre-made models to use in their games. Publishing asset packs like this would become an increasingly important part of the company's business model in the future. Lee, meanwhile, is already working on his next product, a game engine that requires no coding to use, intended to bring game creation to the masses. The 3D Game Maker was primarily designed to be as easy to make a game as possible. Anyone without any experience could boot up the software and make a game. And, the, and it was effectively a multiple choice game maker. Pick the general theme, pick some enemies, pick an end of level boss, choose a weapon or something like that. And it would take all them choices, mix it around in a bag and then produce the game. Written in Dark Basic, the 3D Game Maker is a simple step-by-step -step way to create games using pre-made levels, enemies and assets. Sounds, textures and behaviours can all be tweaked from within the editor and the final games saved as standalones, so you can share them with your friends. The 3D Game Maker was developed with financial backing from Actualize, who hoped to secure a lucrative publishing deal with well-known British publisher, Sales Curve Interactive. And Actualize had a lot of clout. They got us onto a conference called, it was called ECTS. And we had a big booth there. 3D Game Maker, huge floor space, lots of pods. Just to see like your name in lights is, is quite intimidating. I expected to go global <laughs> when I saw that booth. Looking back, the 3D Game Maker seems very primitive, even for its time. Perhaps this is why SCI wasn't interested. Actualize now needed to find a new publisher. It wasn't at the same quality level as games of the day. No one would take your game seriously if you created it in the 3D Game Maker. It was a simple game. Some of the combinations were quite ludicrous, but it was fun, it was creative. That's what I liked about the product but it would never have been confused as something you would go out and make a game with and sell. That said, we did actually offer a license for £500 if you wanted to take the game you'd made and, uh, and sell it. And believe it or not, we actually sold quite a few of those licenses. Actualize turned to Focus Multimedia to publish the 3D Game Maker. Formed in 1995, Focus had rapidly established itself publishing multimedia CD-ROM bundles and niche titles like Cross Stitch Pattern Creator and the Mind of Knowledge series, often deliberately pricing low to encourage impulse purchases. With the 3D Game Maker hitting stores in 2001, Focus then approached the game creators to develop the latest in their flagship educational series, Driving Test Success. Welcome to Driving Test Success Practical. Released in 2003, Driving Test Success Practical, once again written in Dark Basic, was the first in a string of successful titles in the series, all developed by the game creators. Today, Driving Theory Test 4-in-1, developed in their later product App Game Kit, 
has been Apple's most popular app of 2018, 19, 20 and 21. With only a small team, the game creators would continue to split their limited resource between driving test success and their flagship game-making products. Even before Dark Basic had launched, Lee had created an online forum for his testers and customers to meet, and by 2002, the burgeoning Dark Basic community had begun to grow. It was a very small team, like I said, if you go back far enough, it was a team of one, and I needed a way to provide support. And the forum seemed like the perfect approach. People could ask the questions. Before I get to answer them, somebody else has already answered the question. But more than that, it, it created a culture. People went to the forum just to have fun, just to talk, to share their interests. Because of this open dialogue, people could openly talk about what was wrong with the product. That is what you want. You want someone who's interested, who wants the product to succeed, but has critique. We don't have to go out and do big studies. You know, these are the people you want the, uh, the advice from. We ended up using the community for not just general ideas, but to put out a, an update that maybe not be the most robust, solid update ever, and see what people think. The forums allow the community to be directly involved in the development of Lee's next release, a program that would go on to be one of the company's best loved and longest serving products. When we worked on the 3D Game Maker, it was very clear that there were a lot of missing functionalities. And we thought, well, we need a better programming language, and that became Dirt Basic Professional. We replaced everything. We wrote it all again from scratch, new compiler. Dirt Basic Professional was a better, much better outfit because it had a plug-in system. You could add batches of new commands to the language and grow that language. And in the end, I think we had, must have been 20 or 30 plugins and not all written by us. Dark AI, Dark Lights, Dark Physics, and then there was other ones that the third parties created. Hi there, my name is Anna. I want to show you something really hot. So the command list went from, I think, 600 or something to many thousands of commands. But all with that philosophy of one command hides a lot of functionality behind it. As well as the various plugins for DB Pro, Lee and Rick also encourage and promote other third party tools through their website and newsletters. Programs like Cartography Shop, Texture Maker, and 3D Canvas Pro. In 2003, Dark Basic Software officially changes its name to The Game Creators Limited and is quickly becoming the go to place for low cost, easy to use game development software. We finished Dark Basic Professional, it was super powerful, very easy to use, rapid application development. Problem not everybody wants to program. And so there needed to be software out there that required no programming whatsoever, but you could still make a game. And so we set out to create a genuine modern game experience in a way to combat some of the critique from the 3D game maker. And so that was FPS Creator. Written in Dark Basic Professional, the ambition is to create an accessible drag and drop game maker with high quality graphics tailored to the popular first-person shooter genre. Work begins in 2003, and the program is officially announced in the February 2004 newsletter, with a scheduled release date later on this year. It's very easy to create games in FPS Creator. We've created a games framework. All you've got to do is drop in some enemies, players, weapons, items, and the engine does the rest. And on top of all that, we've used DirectX 9C, the latest technology from Microsoft we have to date. But it's here cracks start to appear. FPS Creator would suffer a troubled and protracted development, with an early access version not launching until February 2005. The time it took to create FPS Creator was just simply due to the complexity of it. 
We were never going to be AAA developers. We were still an extremely small team working remotely. There was no premises. To even get near what a modern game has to do, a lot of work has to happen. The editor, we did six versions of that editor before we settled on, oh, that's, that's really fun, that's really easy to use. The fact that it would automatically build the walls and add the corners or subtract a corner. All these things needed to have been iterated over until we actually got that sweet spot. Time constraints caused many of the planned features to be cut. Projectile based bullets with realistic ricochets, gone. Water effects including flooding, delayed. Ragdoll physics, postponed. Ladders, removed. After several delays, FPS Creator finally hits the shelves in September 2005. Despite a lukewarm critical reception, FPS Creator fares better with the general public and the existing game creators community. Version 1 is a substantial leap forward from the 3D game maker. Users paint their levels on a grid system and have a number of brushes to punch windows, doors and air vents into the walls. Its easy and intuitive interface allows users to quickly drop in some enemies, weapons and scenery into a level and test it out in minutes. AI is handled through a simple proprietary scripting language called FPI, and enemies can easily be spawned on queue, made to follow simple waypointed paths, and carry a weapon. Light mapping is possible, and there's basic tools to help you optimize your game for older hardware. FPSC quickly begins to attract new audiences to the game creators community. I had tried some basic programming, but didn't really have the technical background to use the engines of the time. And back then there was no Unity engine, there was no uh, Unreal engine, at least not the way it is now. There was nothing really out there for non-coders. One day I remember searching on Google for game makers and first-person shooter type things. Eventually FPS Creator came up and I clicked on it and I was looking there thinking, wow, that looks too good to be true. Level editor was super easy to use. It made sense for someone that wasn't used to navigating a camera around a 3D environment. I was just amazed by what you could achieve going in with, with no previous re real background of knowing how to make games and things like that. It was extremely fast, easy to do. You could change everything, but the core framework of a first person shooter was there and it was already coded for you. But it was your own game in a sense, even if it was janky, even if it was lagging, it was yours and you could really make it look any way you wanted. I was blown away by what was being created and I didn't create the game maker to do those sorts of things. People were doing stuff for the tool that I hadn't made. It was workarounds and new content being brought in and there were actually some commercial games that weren't as good as the stuff that was being produced with FPS Creator. Unfortunately, FPS Creator is not without its issues. The engine was terribly unoptimized when it comes to memory use. So your levels had to be very small. Also, the memory would not empty properly between loading levels. So if you had a game that was longer than, let's say, uh, six, seven levels, it would at least crash once for the player. Or it might have even been my own inability to optimize my own assets or my own code or whatever. But it's like, I'm not a coder, I'm an artist. And that's why I like FPS Creator. It just seemed like whenever you went all out on something, you know, for whatever reason, it was no fault of your own, it just wouldn't work. Like, you know, even if you did get it to build, it would not work for everybody on everybody's computer. Other complaints focus on the lighting, the AI, and the poor frame rates even on powerful hardware for the time. The gameplay options out of the box are also limited to shooting, flicking switches, key finding, and box stacking. The critique I would have for FPS Creator was the on the, the quality side. 
We were not AAA developers, so we didn't have AAA developer artists, and we didn't have infinite funds and infinite time to create it. And remember, with FPS Creator, you could sell what you make. But I don't think many people would have wanted to have sold their FPS Creator game creation up against the likes of what the AAA games were at that time. For Lee, I'm sure it's really easy for him to be like, oh, well, you know, if the modelers had made better assets, FPS Creator would have done better. But no, like, how well a game engine does and sells is comes down to that core game loop, that thing that you do over and over and over and over again, being satisfying. And in FPS Creator, like, you know, it really just like wasn't satisfying to shoot somebody. I mean, of course, the art assets didn't look great in all of FPS Creator games because lighting and so on. But the models themselves, they aged extremely well to the point that I use them now in Unreal Engine 5. Especially science fiction uh, art assets that came with FPS Creator are awesome. Way better than anything they had in Game Group way better than anything they have now in Game Guru Max. The game creators, meanwhile, remain strangely quiet. In its first year, five official model packs launch, adding more modern day content to FPSC. But it's not until September 2006, a year after release, that an update finally drops. Another follows just five days later. Then another ten days after that. New features are added. Could FPSC finally be about to overcome its shortcomings? Sadly, the reason for the initial silence soon becomes clear. The Game Creators present FPS Creator X10 The first 3D game maker exclusive to Windows Vista. Create your very own game with ease and harness the awesome power of DirectX 10. We wanted to give FPS Creator a visual makeover with the latest, greatest technology. Possibly in response to this feeling that why aren't our games looking as good as the modern games? Well, we're just cramming a lot of uh, technology. And so we took uh, one of NVIDIA's prototype graphics cards and we said, right, we're going to put all of these features into FPS Creator. But we were the first developer to do a technology demo with that particular graphics card. Well, this is uh, FPS Creator X10. It is the next generation of FPS Creator technology. So, I need DirectX 10, do I? What else do I need? You also need a top-of-the-line card, which right now, at this very time, there is only one card, and that's the G8800. You'll need Windows Vista, and you'll need a DirectX 10 driver. And thanks to DirectX 10, we can have one character, and then tell the GPU to give me that character 100 times, so what you're saying is on, on DirectX 10, I can fill my level full of characters and I'm not going to get any noticeable uh, slowdown. Exactly. We actually went to another conference with it because we wanted an OEM deal. We wanted to have it put in a graphics card and no OEM wanted to do the deal, wouldn't touch us. It was a waste of our time to go up on stage and present this idea because we didn't understand the business model at the time. Good life lesson that, you know, make sure you know who your audience is before you open your mouth. <laughs> I was very excited. I didn't really understand, you know, what DirectX 10 was or how that was different from DirectX 9. I didn't have the hardware to uh, to use FPSC X10 at the time. I don't know. I saw it. I was like, oh, that looks sick. But like somewhere, I guess, lingering in the back of my mind was like, man, I wish they just like keep working on FPS Creator. X10 supposedly it looked really great. You could shoot all these enemies and it didn't lag and whatever, but I was just like, it. like I'm gonna wait until I can do that in FPS Creator. For the company, it was a new product, but for the community, I thought it was disastrous. And I just felt that it was premature and I did not have a Vista machine and it, it just didn't interest me given that I already had at FPS Creator. With X10 being the priority, the original FPSC, now called FPS Creator Classic, receives only a smattering of updates in 2007. To sustain interest, the game creators commissioned talented members of the community to create more model packs, bringing us Egyptian assets and modern weapons, with the quality and release schedule becoming increasingly erratic. On a single day in November 2007, they released six new model packs at once. Development on X10, meanwhile, stutters. Despite issue 50 of the game creators' newsletter slating an April release date, it's not until late November that X10 finally launches. It 
In many ways, it's everything FPSC Classic should have been. The graphics are much improved, and new features like ragdoll physics, water and allies now come as standard. But it too is plagued with bugs. Certain weapons can crash your game, so can just opening the pause menu. And those next-gen graphics come at a cost. X10's performance is often sluggish, especially on larger levels. And despite taking advantage of DirectX 10's latest features, it instantly looks dated next to the likes of Crisis, released just two weeks prior to X10. But undoubtedly the biggest nail in X10's coffin is its exclusivity to Windows Vista. It's hard to remember now just how much hype surrounded the new operating system in 2006, but when Vista failed to live up to expectations, FPS creator X10's fate was sealed. It's not the first time TGC have backed the wrong horse, and I think Windows Vista, we should never have backed that particular horse. But the other time, very clearly in my mind, was when there was a war between Blu-ray and HD DVD. A company called Sonic Solutions came to us and said, we, you know, we make game makers, why not make a high-definition DVD game maker? Well, we thought it was a good idea at the time. Which of those formats do you think we created a whole game maker around? It was at E3, I think. When we was there with our product showing potential customers for a possible deal. And it was announced that uh, Blu-ray had won and there is no, no such thing as HD DVD. And we had this game maker that was now useless. But luckily, I guess, the format war ended quite quickly. <laughs> Otherwise, we could have spent a lot of money and not got anywhere. Initially, the game creators prioritise X10, announcing in early 2008 that FPSC Classic will only receive stability updates going forward. Soon after, they launched the Game Creators Store, a content browser built directly into both Classic and X10, allowing users to buy assets from artists in the community. The Game Creators taking a hefty cut, of course. But they also begin flooding their website with new asset packs to renew interest in FPSC Classic. So it was very clear that we also need to provide media. And I, we did, boy did we provide media, and we sold those. And great thing about model packs, we don't have to create all the art. We can find models from anywhere, license, find artists who are interested, they can make stuff. At the same time, we opened up the source code a little bit. Meanwhile, some community members, dissatisfied by the lack of official updates, take it upon themselves to start modifying FPSC's source code to add new features. The first mods for FPS Creator start appearing in late 2007, and within months, several mods spring up adding new features to single player and multiplayer and improving the graphics. I knew enough about the software to make changes myself. I was really interested in looking at shaders and the graphic side of things, so I thought, okay, there might be other people that would benefit from this. And then we encouraged that. We thought, this is great. We get like extra team members working on FPS Creator. We was a business, so where do we put our focus? And the, the reason FPS Creator was focused on more than X10 is of all that activity. There was a lot of activity going on in, with that product, and that's not a product you abandon, that's a product you keep on and keep working on. With X10 stagnating, the game creators switch focus back to FPSC Classic in 2010 and begin integrating these community-made mods into the engine itself in many cases surpassing what X10 is capable of. And so we folded in those contributions and it allowed FPS Creator to continue to be worked on. With no official word on the future of X10, X10 users questioned Lee directly. On the 7th of May 2010, FPS Creator X10 is pronounced dead, with all focus now on improving classic. <laughs> Yet more model packs are released, along with several milestone updates. Even Dark Voices gets added, bringing rudimentary lip-syncing to certain characters. Hello, I like comics for the pictures. Elsewhere, seeing the rise of mobile gaming prompts the game creators to develop App Game Kit in 2011, an easy-to-use game engine for making cross-platform mobile apps, which proved successful. But behind the scenes, ideas are already formulating for a second successor to FPS Creator. It wouldn't be until October 2012 that the new engine would break cover for the first time. Hi, Rick here from the Game Creators. FPS Creator Reloaded is an awesome tool for making your own first-person shooter games. 
FPS Creator Reloaded will be an amazing leap forward technology wise. Here we're showing a level that will be typical of a quality you'll be able to create really easily. Unlike previous TGC products, FPS Creator Reloaded is launched via a Kickstarter campaign. We've been listening to the community, so we've added lots of features recommended by them. We've added a few features of our own. We've got a great team, we've got some great artists, some great graphics and shaders lined up, but we do need your help. Relying mainly on their existing community, TGC only manages to raise about a third of the £60,000 fundraising goal. But then, on the final day of the campaign, an anonymous investor pledges the remaining 38k, saving the project. Development begins in earnest, with Lee sharing his progress through regular blogs, and additional crowdfunding being gathered through the FPS Creator website. It takes over a year before the beta of Reloaded finally drops. A week to go to the beta, how are you feeling about it? Supremely confident, Rick. Uh, I'm going to focus on performance, performance and let's see the one. performance. What would a pledger be able to expect from beta 1? Mm, awesome fun. <laughs> Despite not being as performant as hoped, FPS Creator Reloaded offers huge freedoms over its predecessor. Gone is the restrictive grid system, replaced by terrain sculpting tools, allowing for much bigger levels. It was satisfying to shoot people now. It was satisfying to run and jump around now. But then there's like all this crucial stuff from FPS Creator that they messed up. So it's like, they're like, they got rid of segments and then they replaced it at first with just a terrain editor and props and it's like, that's, that doesn't do it for me. With no internal testing team, the game creators rely heavily on their backers, who get access to the betas as one of their perks, to report issues. The only way to know whether your product is going to stand up in the real world is to put it in the real world. Triple A's, they'll block off whole rooms, cram them with people, and have them constantly playing that software. Then it goes out into the real world, and lo and behold, there's still bugs in it. And the reason we don't do that is we don't have a building we don't have three months of, of leisure time just to sit on the software, but we do take advantage of that real world testing. We can't own every graphics card, every system. Sadly, as with FPS Creator, many of the features listed across the Kickstarter, website and Lee's blogs and forum posts never make it into Reloaded. Allies, tracers and laser beams, parallax occlusion mapping, uh, multiple cameras, so you can and attach, attach a, a camera to your rocket. Oh, the multiple cameras attach it to the rocket and fly it down a corridor. Surely there are more important things Lee you could be working on. <laughs> dynamic objects taken into account by the light mapper. Baked lights and real dynamic lights. They're two completely different systems. Getting them to marry it nicely together is always a, a, a tricky one. A menu editor. You could do a menu editor, but you had to go into Notepad. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Refraction and distortion textures. Bullet holes and blood splatters. Windows that shatter. Soft particles. CSG punch message to punch holes in walls to get windows oh, and doors. Yes. I used to love that. I feature. regret. The reason it was taken out, there's a, co there's a performance cost. It takes time to punch all them holes. But I love CSG. It, you could take. 10 models and turn it into 50 models. But yeah, I regret not having CSG to this day. It's about cleaning up the user experience and when it's been scaled back, it's not out of spite, it's how do we make it easier for a new user to get used to the software. One feature touted for Reloaded is VR support. Although it temporarily makes its way into a beta, VR would later be dropped altogether. This is despite the game creator's long history with VR products. So my name is Warren Black, I'm the CEO of VR Quest, and um, I personally have been integrating virtual reality educational game design uh, longer than anybody in the world. I actually, my first program, I started in 1993. I was using other game design software that were violent, and I don't want any violence in any of the games that I have. Then I met um, the game creators probably about 15 years ago. But Warren liked FPS creators so much, that he thought, can you take all the violence out? Because I want to put VR in it. I said, what? VR? And he had a perfectly brilliant idea, which of course is to uh, re-engage students with their content. For a 10 year old, it's really exciting to put this thing on and see stereoscopic world that you've created. 
And I got the buzz as well, because inside I'm just a 10 year old. I essentially called them in England and kept bothering them and they finally said, okay, we can meet and they've helped me the whole way. They've been a great supporter of the program and uh, you know, we have a great relationship. So we have virtual reality going back as far as this one, it's the oldest one. The Mirage, the Oculus Quest, the Quest 2, there's some more up here, that's a Dell, that's the uh, HTC, that's a development kit for the early uh, Oculus. Then we have the lowest spec laptop you can buy that can run VR. It's a good test bed. To this day, we're still supporting uh, Warren with an improved version of VR Quest. And now I'm selling our version here in uh, North America, being distributed by Hamilton Buell across the United States with uh, about 90 resellers. Training, hardware, so everything is a package, a support package. We originally had social studies, now we have social studies, science, math, and English. So um, for fourth grade through 12th grade, so we have a full complement of uh, content. Despite newer versions of VR Quest running on a branch of the FPS Creator Reloaded engine, Reloaded itself would not deliver VR support beyond a short-lived tech demo in one of the betas. Adding virtual reality was definitely something I was thinking about. In contrast to all of the other features that we'd already said we'd do. I had no right to put my personal preference into the game maker when we'd already said, oh, we're going to add this, we're going to add that. Even seven years ago, VR was a niche, you know, rich person's toy. You know, balancing all that up, it's like, that's probably why it never got priority and never ended up in the um, early version so there's no like contract in place to keep the VR thing exclusive to VR Quest. That's their decision. I, you know, I mean, I can't say to a company, don't do VR. You know, we offer suggestions and we offer our insight. I love coders like Lee, you know, they're, they're out, he's out in Wales in his room with his five computers and, but I'm out in the real world and I'm selling the product. So, you know, you work together as a team and figure out, okay, well, how do we separate the products, how do we make it so it works for both of us and come up with something that works for both parties, or all parties. Instead, work in 2014 focuses on bringing more fundamental features to Reloaded, such as an in-game editing mode and improvements to AI scripting. Rather than relying on FPS Creator's limited and performance sapping FPI scripting language, Reloaded instead supports Lua, a popular coding language in game development. Despite being relatively easy to learn, not all of the community supports the change. I really liked FPI because it was like simple, like I'm not a coder, but I can make, make sense. Like if this list of words that are basically plain English, then this list of words that are basically plain English. So it just it, you know made a lot of sense to me. I could write scripts for a lot of stuff. More positively, Lua dramatically increases both performance and the potential for unique scripts in users' games. But not all the development decisions during this time are remembered fondly. A complaint about FPS creators' development had been the game creator's lack of transparency about feature plans and timescales. To help address this for Reloaded, TGC launched a feature voting page, where community members can vote for which feature should be developed next. Now we thought this was a really good idea because we basically aggregate what are the most wanted features and we'll work on those features. What happened? That feature list grew so quickly that a million TGCs could not have completed every feature. The features voting board was absolutely awful. There was this diametrical opposition of community members who wanted serious, sustainable features to make a decent game engine that could support a full video game. And a lot of casual users who were uh, voting for third person view or role playing game features or drivable vehicles and things like that. The way I saw it back then, the uh, entire project lost its focus. What we found is in the end, the voting board was creating as much disappointment as facility. It would only lead to disappointment, especially when people have a feature that they've been waiting for and it never gets done. If I say a thing, I better deliver it. It's, it's not a good thing to say you're going to do a thing and then not do it. Or take such a long time to do it, you may as well not bother because by the time you've finished it, the person who wanted it in the first place is gone. The game creators also take advantage of the new Steam Greenlight initiative, once again leaning on their community for votes and making FPS Creator Reloaded one of the few game creation tools accepted onto Steam, a move that would have both positive and negative impacts in the future.
By 2015, Reloaded is in its third year of development, but is still blighted by bugs and performance issues. Rather than concentrate on improving the core FPS features of Reloaded, the game creators instead decide to rebrand the engine to Game Guru, an all-purpose easy game maker. Why do we have to just be a, a first-person shooter? Why can't we be a third person or a driving game or an adventure game? Can't we not have a more broader appeal and thus attract more users? This was the logic. While some of the community is excited by the prospect of creating games in different genres, many others, particularly those who funded Reloaded, feel TGC are revoking their promises. To calm tensions, TGC gift their backers thousands of FPS creator assets to use in Game Guru. Except not only are some of these assets pushing 10 years old at this point, most are copy-pasted directly from FPSC into Game Guru, with many still referencing parameters and scripts from FPSC rather than Game Guru. And although the broader scope would in time lead to a handful of non-FPS games being developed in Game Guru, most of the non-FPS features were never fully implemented. And they added features like top-down view and third-person view. There was no inventory, the character could not switch his gun. You could just kind of pilot him around, awkwardly. The first-person shooter part was the only part that was really useful in Game Guru. And most of these features were not made by the game creators themselves, but by a FPS creator user called Airslight, who made a mod for FPS creator back then that added all these features like gun lag, like being able to aim your guns and all those detailed features that we have with the weapons in Game Guru, and they were just um, translated from FPS Creator to Game Guru. All the rest was abandoned the moment it was introduced. It was just, here is third person view, and that was it. This lack of quality assurance is sadly reflected throughout Game Guru, despite TGC's best efforts to improve the product and add more features. The editor is simple and easy to master, but also prone to crashing. A character creator is added, but is extremely limited. Even the easy building editor, which lets users build small structures on a grid system similar to FPS Creator, is more restrictive than its predecessor, developed a decade earlier. The rendering of the engine is extremely ugly. It's not a pretty to look at engine. The AI was extremely goofy and limited, and it was very difficult to uh, write your own AI, simply because there was no real documentation. There was a list of Lua commands, and good luck making sense of that and writing a, a functioning AI out of that. Once again, the Game Gear game, it either wouldn't load all the levels, or, you know, you'd load it and like half the level would be missing because you wanted to light map it. And this is kind of also like in FPS Creator, where some users would have problems that other users could simply not replicate. Um, I have been accused, quite rightly, of it's good enoughness, right? It works. Well, what do you want? It works. Of course, what I'm not seeing is the difference between it works and it's something anyone would want to use. There's a quality bar that I set relatively low because the functionality is there, but there's more work that is required to get to that high level of quality and that polish that everyone says, yes, now that is nice. And I seldom get to that point simply because there's another thing to write. I need to get on and make something else work. The memory management issues from FPS Creator pervade Game Guru too, except now they're more apparent because of the larger map size and higher quality assets. Game Guru can't load and unload assets on the fly as is typical in most modern games. Instead, everything must be loaded up front, leading to long load times and sapping performance. The performance is atrocious. Even though you use media with the pulley count and the texture resolutions of um, games from the mid-2000s, really, you will end up with frame drops. You will end up with performance problems. If you want to sell a game that looks like it came out 15 years ago, but runs uh, at 25 frames per second, that's a problem. I think the problem is that they have, you know, under the hood, like optimization issues and like real, like core, core problems that are like it doesn't matter what features you build on top of this like pile of sand it's going to wash away when the tide's coming you know instead of trying to fix these underlying problems they're just like Let, let's make it x11 and make everything pbr you know what i mean you're like oh my god you know what i mean like haven't you done this before like how did that go over last time across steam and youtube game guru receives heavy criticism this is a scam and should be banned from steam game guru is nothing but garbage, and allows lazy, incompetent developers to upload 
the biggest waste of freaking space ever. Absolutely abysmal engine, total waste of time and money. The engine this game runs on is terrible. I have a brand new high-end PC and at times my frame rate would often dip below 30 and 20. This is inexcusable. Not to mention once your game is made standalone, the load times and frame rate are just as bad. Any negative review is going to cut. You create something, you put it into the world, and you're happy. So then when you get a review and someone smashes it to pieces, it hurts. But I... I, have a good, I think I have a positive attitude towards that. I, I always try and look for the advantages and the positives out of a thing and use that to make the product better. What's appealing about GameGuru is that it's almost competent. You can see all the features, all the scripts. You can see in your mind how you could make a whole game out of it. But if you try to actually implement that, it will fall short and there will be problems and it will in the end not work. I think in all those years that the engine was around, there are maybe five somewhat competent games that have been made with it, maybe a, maybe 10. That is a bit um, kind of a testament to how difficult it is to make a working game in this easy game maker. Instead, zero effort cash grabs designed to take advantage of the low barrier to entry on Steam flood the market, further tarnishing GameGuru's reputation. Glitch Simulator 2018 is the worst game ever. How do I know this? Well, for starters, it's made in goddamn GameGuru. If you look on Steam Store, you see trash games made by this software. If I was being cynical here, I'd say that the person that made this game didn't actually create any of the things you see here. He just sort of threw together basic game guru assets into a blank map and called it a day. Do you think this one's gonna be an asset flip? I think this one's gonna be an asset flip. This, guys, is why Game Guru is a game engine you don't want to use. It's complete crap. I've pointed this out many, many times. If you're serious about making a game and putting it on Steam, do not use Game Guru. Are you dissatisfied by the fact that almost nobody has been able to create and release a proper game using Game Guru? So, I'm not disappointed that Game Guru games haven't done as well ever as FPS creator ones. I am a little disappointed that some people thought it was okay to take one of our demo games that came with the product, change the title, save standalone, and then sold it on Steam. That's like, we never intended that to happen. The result of that is Steam reviewers are very quick to find these horrible examples on their store and we almost became known that a game guru game on steam was this sort of asset flip piece of rubbish you got the stigma attached to anyone writing and publishing game in game guru i have seen some excellent games in game guru uh, in development we made it so easy to make a game and let people go and sell it that they did exactly that they spent a whole week <laughs> writing their game and then that, that'll do and then they put it on uh, on steam i'm not going to criticize someone's idea if they have an idea and they execute it well and create that game and that game is fun that's the important thing the technology that it sits on isn't as important as the imagination the creativity that you bring to that project Despite this, GameGuru has produced a handful of impressive games created by developers undeterred by the engine's shortcomings and reputation. One of the most well-known examples is Dark Skies The Nemansk Incident, recently released by DK Productions. When I started with GameGuru, it was in 2016. GameGuru is basically a level editor and I always liked uh, doing stuff with level editors like games in Far Cry 2, the Stronghold series, and so I found myself feeling at home with Game Guru right away. Dark Skies is highly inspired by Stalker. I wanted to have big maps with many details, enemies and, you know, a couple of scripts also. At that time, Game Guru wasn't ready for a game like this. And back then, when you placed like 20 trees in a level, it was already like at 30 FPS. So presumably Dark Skies has sort of improved as Game Guru has improved over the years. Yeah, I've been working on it for like, uh, I think it's been three and a half years now actually. I released many games over the years made with Game Guru, even small ones. 
I always was like, okay, this is a really cool piece of software and I love using it. I've gotten so many comments over the years, like uh, people said, um, wow, that's amazing. I uh, was about to give up on Game Guru, but uh, you made me come back. You know, my Game Guru mission is to let people know that this can indeed be a really cool software if you know how to use it and if you are willing to learn and dive into the material. The game creator's periodic updates to GameGuru have sought to address criticism of the performance, graphics and AI. 2015 sees GameGuru converted from Dark Basic Professional to C++. In 2017, Lee begins rewriting the graphics engine to support physically based materials, although this is never fully implemented. And in 2018, improvements are made to the dynamic lights, AI and a basic particle system is added. Increasingly though, it's left to community members to step up and fix GameGuru's bugs themselves. Although 2019 sees TGC release an evolution of App GameKit, the well-received App GameKit Studio, they remain unusually tight-lipped on the future of GameGuru. In early 2020, the reason for the radio silence is revealed. Rather than working directly on GameGuru, the game creators have instead spent much of 2019 developing the latest version of VRQuest. This is framed optimistically. The cache injection will help TGC continue their work, and the new features developed of VRQuest will soon trickle down into GameGuru. What they don't say is that it won't be the current incarnation of GameGuru. GameGuru Classic is based on Dirt Basic Pro. We made the decision to move it to C++, but we didn't write it from scratch. We wrote a converter, which would take the entire Dirt Basic script, if you call it, basic, and convert it to its equivalent C++. The problem is, we were still stuck with this old, over 10 year old game engine programming language tech. One of the big critiques of Game Guru Classic was the visuals just weren't there. We were being compared to 3D games from 1995. That's how passionate people on Steam hated the visuals of, of Game Guru Classic. But it finally reached a point where we thought, we really do need a new graphics engine now. We do need to upgrade all of the technology on which these games and our game maker is built. And we finally landed on a product called Wicked Engine, which was an open source graphics engine, it wasn't really a games engine, more of a graphics engine. We already had the game engine, we just needed a nice new graphics engine, but bit by bit, we started replacing all of the old stuff. If it was just little bits and tweaks here and there, yeah, we could have called it Game Guru Classic Update. But by the time we'd finished, we'd practically ripped everything out of the, that was old and we put in all new things. It was a new product. And so Game Guru Max became that. It was the answer to all of the critique that Game Guru Classic has met over the last five years. And a rewrite was the way to do it. Game Guru Max boasts a completely new UI and a new faster interface, as well as enhanced rendering engine for great visuals, advanced terrain and environment systems, a brand new character creator, VR support, and Photon for standalone multiplayer support. The team have introduced a new dynamic lure system, which allows the user to control script behaviors from simple gadgets, so users never have to touch a single line of code. Plus, all the characters created will be able to perform gestures, head look and lip sync talk by simply recording your voice or typing the speech directly into the editor. This is without a doubt the most significant upgrade in Game Guru's history and addresses key feedback received from our amazing community of game makers. Despite an extensive feature list, all of this is to be developed in just six months in time for a September 2020 launch. I instantly bought it because I wanted to get my hands on the early builds as well. I was excited, but I was also aware that this is a long-term project. When news of Game Guru Max came out, I know there were mixed reactions to that. I was just saying, okay, well, let, let's see what that has to offer and how that's going to differ from, from Classic. But not everyone shares the cautious optimism for Max. We do not need another Game Guru. TGC pulled the plug on crowdfunding Max after just three days due to only receiving three backers. There would be a strong reason to not even call it Game Guru Max and just a whole new name. But at the same time, we're already known. We've been bouncing around the Game Guru name for about seven years. It's 
people know what it is. Even if, oh yeah, I know what Gengar is, it's rubbish, <laughs> that's fine. And, and hopefully we can sort of lean it towards just people referring to it as Max. When people say, oh, it's a game written in Game Guru, they'll say, which one? Is it the classic or is it the Max one? Because we've actually pulled away so much in terms of how it looks, the speed of it, its capabilities, um, the, the built-in logic, the new things that we've put in to uh, make that intuitive game making experience even easier and even more fulfilling. Once again, the game creators turn to their community and pre-order customers to evaluate alpha builds of Game Guru Max. We've had some bad press. We're putting software out that make could have stayed internal for another three months. But then the community does like to get their hands on things as soon as it's playable. You know, because then it's like, well, as you've not finished it yet, can you add this and can you subtract that? And what about this? And that didn't work very well. And so they become part of the development process. And I don't regret that. I'm sure another CEO would do it very differently, but that's not me and uh, I don't think it ever will be me. <laughs> As development progresses, it becomes increasingly clear that Max will be in no fit state to be released in September. TGC pushed the official launch date initially to October, then to December, eventually opting to remove a deadline altogether. It was always well meant the deadline. We looked at the time we had and what we needed to do. What happened was, as we got closer to that deadline, it was very obvious we hadn't hit the mark. We didn't feel like that quality was there. It was a hard decision, but we thought we, we've got to do it. We've got to make sure that we're happy with this product before we put it out into the world. So we'll get it all done for Christmas and then we'll release it and everyone have a nice Christmas present and they can play it at Christmas. Rick was um, looking at the software and uh, saying, no, we're not hit the mark yet. So what do you mean? Everything's ready, we're ready to roll. And so, because we'd already done it once, we thought, well, it, it felt right before, it also feels right now. We're going to disappoint a lot of people, but let's do it right. The open release date gives Lee and the team the chance to reevaluate the engine and redesign it from the ground up. Despite an unusually large amount of time being dedicated to redesigning the UI of the engine, eventually improvements to the character creator, object library, and lighting follow. A visual logic system is added to help minimise the need for writing code. A procedural terrain generator gets added. And AI for enemies, allies and animals is written. TGC are also noticeably more transparent too, with Lee hosting weekly live broadcasts to update on the latest developments, including Q&As. Hello everybody, it's Lee Bamba from The Game Creators. More attention is paid this time to managing users' expectations too, with most requests for features not in scope getting the same answer. There are no plans to support cave creation in Game Guru Max, no plans to do tracers, there is no plans to make it run on Mac, and there's no plans to export it so it runs on Android or iOS. We are not planning to support RTX for Max. No plans for a grid system on the terrain, no serious massive plans for all this debugging lines that you might draw over. The short answer is no and no plans to. That's not planned for Max and that's not on our roadmap. It's a good idea, certainly add it to GitHub as a feature request, but it's not something we're planning to do for Max. Despite a slightly embarrassing incident where TGC attempts to bribe Steam users into leaving positive reviews of Game Guru Classic, which did not go down well, development on Max progresses steadily. It takes over a year to release the next public build, but finally, in March 2022, Game Guru Max officially relaunches in early access on Steam. In many ways, Game Guru Max feels like Lee Bamba's greatest hits. The flowchart-like storyboard editor used to edit menu screens and access levels is straight out of click and play. Dynamic Lua is reminiscent of the in-game customization from the 3D game maker. Allies are back for the first time since FPS Creator X10, and the character creator and model importer build on the groundwork established in Game Guru Classic. A year of early access development has seen new functionality added to make puzzle and role-playing games possible, and a particle system has been added. 
Yet despite all this, Max is failing to connect with many long-standing members of the community. I, I'm not really using Max myself very much at the moment. It's just that I um, took a look at GameGuru Max and it didn't appear to me. So if I invest the same amount of time in Unreal Engine 5 or in Unity or in any other engine, I will have better results, something more worthwhile, something that can be enjoyed by more people than if I in invested amount of time in GameGuru Max. As a GameGuru Classic user who has spent thousands of hours in GameGuru, it's really hard to get into GameGuru Max, which is something I don't understand. You cannot use your normal workflow to create levels in GameGuru Max. It just throws me off every time I use it. It's not intuitive. I think the biggest issue actually is the graphics because it just looks plain ugly. There is something in the Game Grow Max rendering system that, you know, it doesn't look right. You've not worked for a studio for almost 25 years. Do you think that puts you at a disadvantage when it comes to the latest technologies and techniques? I would say yes. Working in a team, Working in a large group of very talented developers, you learn so much so quickly. And I've noticed this recently myself as our team got bigger, how I can now bounce more ideas around the team and answers come thick and fast if I went the AAA route. I think I'd be richer. I think I'd be more specialised. But no, uh, no regrets. I don't see that being the case. I think I did so much um, going the solo route and building a company. I had to invent everything from scratch. And that's probably come through in the software that you've seen produced from TGC over the last 20 years. I think it's a, it's a different way of doing things. Hopefully it produces software that's more unique than the traditional stuff that gets rolled out of the sausage factories. So yeah, I think it was probably a, an interesting journey and not, nothing to be regretted. Instead, GameGuru Max is enticing a whole new generation of aspiring developers to take their first tentative steps into game development. I'm relatively new to the community. Uh, I primarily use GameGuru Max, but I have used Classic a little bit, and I started in late 2020, early 2021. Being creative is something that I've always had in me, and I've enjoyed games since I was a kid. Back when I discovered GameGuru and GameGuru Max, I didn't have a lot of money at the time, and I looked at it and I was like, oh, this is amazing, I can make a game. Like, I've always wanted to do this, and I've never, never had a chance to, so. It allowed me to be creative, but also produce something and be happy with something that other people can play. Knowing where GameGuru Max is going and what it's going to be capable of in the future, I've really used this as my main engine moving forward. There are members of the community contributing to the development of GameGuru Max, which has brought it along in leaps and bounds. I play a lot of RPGs and they're third person RPGs and that's the type of game that I really enjoy. So knowing that RPG is in the process of being implemented into Game Guru Max, seeing that as a future feature is what excites me more than anything else. Today, several of the game creators' previous engines have gone on to find new life thanks to their communities. TGC's interest in FPS Creator fizzled out in 2013 but it was eventually open sourced in 2016 and has since seen huge improvements thanks to the community made Black Ice Mod. It started off very, very small. It was really some source code improvements that s had worked on. And then I kind of added some extra shaders. One of my personal goals was to get to a point where your level will look, you know, consistently good. We've been able to do things that we had never envisaged doing, such as getting the FPSC online multiplayer working again. We've also had a lot of help from community members, and we were just really lucky to be able to get in contact with them, and uh, they were willing to come back and help with certain things. Black Ice Mod, I think we spent about five years working on that and supporting that. Black Ice Mod Advanced, which we've just released um, the, the beta for recently, we've been working on for the last two years. But to see people really enthusiastic and getting involved and using it and giving us good feedback and showing us the projects that they're working on, that's the thing that I think, you know, has, has kept us going. You can actually start to make, you know, a level that uh, doesn't even really look like a, an original FPSC level. 
Although Game Guru Classic officially remains a TGC product, they have recently started accepting community-made improvements, adding new features to the aging engine. As for Game Guru Max, its future remains uncertain. The proliferation of free-to-use engines like Unreal and Unity make Max, with its $40 price tag, a harder sell. There are still major concerns over Max's performance and stability too. And although DLC packs are helping to grow Max's asset library, it remains to be seen if this will help Max escape the moniker of an asset flip engine like Game Guru Classic before it. I suspect Max's legacy lies as much in the hands of its users and the games they make with it as it does in the hands of the game creators developing the tools. A lot of the negative feedback that people have been giving them, I think, is very unfounded. And what they've got to remember is that this company is a small company, a small team of people. And while they've been creating game creation tools for a long time, what they're doing isn't easy. I, I want to see the game creators make a really successful engine. I think they they have a, a much better plan for Max. I really hope that they kind of add the extra polish and uh, stability required so that, ev that everything works as well as it possibly can. Judging by the game creators or what I've seen over the years, it's like any, the game creators product takes like, you know, seven to eight years to get anywhere near like what they promise the first time they start talking about it. You know, I'm going to keep watching, seeing what they make, seeing what they put out, seeing how it does, playing games made with it. But I don't want to torment myself by spending, you know, weeks and weeks and months and, you know, even years making a bunch of art and assets and animations and all this stuff to put into this game and then build a game and you know either it doesn't build or it doesn't work on everybody's computer if i see somebody grab game guru max and like make the exact type of game i want to make and i download it and i play it and it runs great and it loads fast and you know what i mean i'm getting 144 hertz locked max settings you know what i mean the fights are fun the guns look cool it's it's fluid you know what i mean it's not like choppy or weird and the ai is good you know what i mean if everything feels like a game should i'll buy that right there you know what i mean i'll literally buy game guru max put all my assets in it and try to make something because why not right it's supposed to be easy you know what i mean but i you know what i mean i don't see that happening and it's like i switched to source i really haven't looked back since like source is literally everything i ever wanted fps creator to be but more capable and in a lot of ways easier we do have other products arguably more successful products but for me i see game guru max much as you've seen with the evolution of all our other products go on for years grow hopefully improve over time and stay relevant we're a game making company and we've always done game makers and we've always tried to produce something that is a bit different that isn't quite like everybody else's and i'm, I'm hoping that game guru max is finally the game maker where you can make a game and you can sell it in the shops and no one will know it was written in Game Guru Max. <laughs> That's the ambition. The game creators' intuitive but often flawed game engines have inspired countless would-be developers to make their own games for almost 25 years. They've certainly proven very adept at making tools for programmers. Their solutions for coders like App Game Kit and Dark Basic Professional have reviewed well and are fondly remembered. But they also know that code isn't sexy and have frequently prioritized graphics over functionality. This has led to a string of engines which are really great for taking screenshots in and doing test scenes, but seldom run efficiently at scale. Their tools for non-coders like FPS Creator and Game Guru have often attracted as much criticism as praise, and a lot of that is because of these performance issues. But TGC also don't think like a non-coder does, which has frequently led to them developing tools and techniques that they think we need, rather than what we actually want. For me, Game Guru Max really feels like a tipping point for the company. The success or failure of Game Guru Max will define the game creators of at least the next decade. Now, if Max fails, no, TGC aren't going anywhere. The steady income from driving test success and VR Quest will probably pay the bills just fine. But Max genuinely might be their last best chance of finally creating an easy, accessible game maker for non-coders. And if it fails, it won't just be a massive blow for TGC, but for their most valuable resource, us, the community. The community has been around since the beginning and it's built up in strata and strength. You know, you only get that from history and events and growth. 
and I'm sure it's set to grow and increase. Game Guru Max does half of what I think it's going to do. Expect crowds. <laughs> I really like the game creators community. You know, they're active. They're all trying to make their own games. And, you know, on some level, I feel like a lot of them are, are like me, you know, they're artists and they just kind of want to make, you know, their, their art into a playable thing. I've developed friends from all around the world. There are people that I talk to on a daily basis that are just amazing people that really look out for you. I mean, I'll just get messages out of nowhere and it will literally just say, Hey, how's your day going? I feel like that's an amazing place to be. So the game creator community is just full of these amazing beautiful people that are willing to help just about anyone if you're serious about it i think it's a great community you know there's a lot of people that have been there for a long time if, you, if you're going to use one of these engines you kind of need to be involved with the community really to get the best out of it uh because there was there is just such a wealth of information that you're going to miss out on if you just you know just look at the manual or try to figure it out yourself it was a very diverse pool of talents with people who worked in various industries and at various skills. And it was just really in interesting to see so many people try to make games, uh, do things, uh, cooperate. So the community kind of existed and the game creators kind of did something else, what they felt were, was marketable at the time. I don't hate the game creators or game guru. I had a lot of fun with the engine, I had a lot of fun in the community through the years. Uh, it's just... I would lie if I were to say that it's competent software, it simply is not. You know, it taught me a lot of stuff about lighting and level design and puzzle design and all that stuff. You know what I mean? It was a good little sandbox to learn it. And now that I, I know all that stuff, I can kind of take those skills other places and that's really nice. It's like, you know, of, of being a, a soccer club fan or football club fan. You know, you love it and hate it at the same time. We have insanely talented people and I have no idea why they are inside this community instead of any other. I hope they incorporate the community better into their projects. You know, they need to exchange uh, with the community, community more. I made this documentary because the dynamic between the game creators and their community fascinates me. TGC often ignore their community's requests for features and tools yet they regard us as vitally important for the testing, bug fixing and content pipelines of their engines. We're more involved than mere customers, but less valued than actual team members. This has led to a tension between the game creators and their community, them versus us, the game creators versus the fans. But the community's talents are broad and their knowledge deep. Perhaps the success of Max even the long-term success of the game creators as a whole depends on a more equitable relationship, a collaboration, a partnership, the game creators with the fans. Wow, I can't believe it's finally finished. Thank you so much for your words of encouragement and your patience over the last year and a bit that it's taken me to make this film. I had no idea when I started that it was gonna end up being an hour and 20 minutes long. I mean, that's longer than the feature film I made when I was 19, which is just crazy. But what are your thoughts on the game creators? Please let me know in the comments below. Let's have a discussion about where you think Game Guru Max is going and your memories of the game creators. As for me, my next video is gonna be a bit of a break from kind of game making stuff. I'm going to do a behind the scenes retrospective look on Ancestors, which is the sci-fi short film I made five years ago, which I nearly won a competition with, but not quite. Uh, next month, FPS Creator Classics is coming back. I've recorded a few more episodes and I've got plenty more lined up ready to do. And then there's other kind of interesting videos in the pipeline that I can't talk too much about. I'd really like to try and grow my little community this year. So if you liked what you saw, please consider subscribing, but also even just a like or a comment on this video does so much to help the channel. So. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.